Good morning. I want to welcome here to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Of course, this is Saturday when we do our taping, but uh, um, we're taping for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. We wish you God's blessings as you worship with us today. And uh, as we have been uh, talking about for a number of weeks, uh, we have a couple of different worship opportunities right now. Um, you, we welcome you to come in on Saturday and worship with us indoors when we tape. We do that at 9.30 a.m. on Saturday, and then that gets posted later, uh, usually Saturday evening, that gets posted on the website. Um, or you can come and worship with us outdoors on Sunday at 9.30. Um, I do the service from a hay rack right on the corner of the parking lot, and so you can either park in the parking lot and, or you can sit on lawn chairs in the lawn, and we broadcast on an FM radio signal, so you can pick it up in your car radio, and we have some uh, radio sitting outside in the grassy area as well. So you have those two worship opportunities, and we continue to do communion on first and third Sundays, and so we will not have communion today, but uh, uh, we will uh, next weekend, we'll have, com will be a communion weekend. Um, so that's the way we're going to do it for a few more weeks. We don't know uh, exactly when we're going to transition to indoor worship on Sunday. Uh, we're going to have that conversation at our next council meeting on September 8th. And so what we're asking people to do uh, between now and then, be before that council meeting if possible, is to give us some input on when we end the outdoor services and, and bring in the Sunday service indoors, how are you most likely to worship? Are you most likely to worship uh, indoors on Sunday? Because we'll be doing it once we uh, move indoors, we'll be doing it indoors on Sunday. Are you more willing to worship indoors on Saturday? Because we generally have a smaller crowd on Saturday. Or will you um, simply be worshiping online, watching this posted uh, service online? And so if you would let us know, uh, we're doing kind of an informal survey. You can call the office or and talk to June. She'll be keeping a tally, or you can email the office and let us know. Um, and we're going to put a tally of uh, how many, because we want to get an idea of how many are going to be worshiping with us on Sunday, how full that's going to be, and that, that uh, will affect what kind of how we do that. So that decision's coming up. We're going to be, but for several weeks anyway, more, we're going to be worshiping outdoors on Sunday. We have some nice weather probably all the way through September, and at some point in October we'll come in. And, uh, and so that's what the decision that's going to be made uh, at the September council meeting. So help us out if you can. Give us an uh, email or a call and say, this is how we'll worship uh, Sunday morning indoors, Saturday indoors, or online. We have a lot of announcements. Birthdays this week. Uh, Sunday, August 30th, is the birthday of Jerry Zebert. So happy birthday, Jerry. Uh, Tuesday, September 1st, is the birthday of Mickey Frazier. Happy birthday to Mickey. On Thursday, September 3rd, is Abby Jaquis's birthday. So happy birthday to Abby on Thursday, September 3rd. And then on Saturday, September 5th, is the birthday of David Olson. That's your daddy, right? Yeah. His birthday is coming up next Saturday, so a week from today. Um, also, uh, some, some uh, great, uh, wonderful news. Some, some babies were born. Uh, Dean Everett Lauf was born on Saturday, August 22nd. Uh, his parents are Jonathan and Heather Lauf, and grandparents are Ty and Lynn Holland, and Neil and Shelley Corbin. So uh, congratulations to that family on the birth of a little baby boy. And then Steve and Sharon Saunders, who are here with us today, were saying they just had... Um, uh, twin grandsons born. Their son uh, had, uh, had baby boys, had twin boys, and their names are Gavin and Perrin. So uh, uh, we're, we celebrate with, with uh, Steve and Sharon, uh, who are new grandparents, and God's blessings to those little, little boys. We also, um, we don't have any anniversaries this week, uh, but we had a wedding last week, uh, the wedding of Jessica Chase and Ethan Kloster, and Ethan's parents are Tom and and uh, Mary Marilyn Kloster and uh, Ethan's grandparents are, are, they're all here today, the ones from our church, uh, Tom and Joe Kloster and Lynn Swanson, uh, the grandparents uh, of Ethan. And so they had a great, great time last week uh, celebrating that, that wedding of, of uh, Jessica Chase and Ethan Kloster. Congratulations to them. A number of prayer concerns. Uh, first of all, uh, we lost one of our members. She was our oldest member. Doris Giltner passed away on Monday. She was 99 years old. She turned 99 in January. It would have been 100 this coming January. And you might remember that her husband, Wilbur, 
uh, passed away last September. They had been married 72 years. He there was the, he'd passed away the day after their 72nd anniversary. Um, and uh, she was over at Liberty Village and she passed away on Monday. And I'm actually doing the funeral this morning at 11 o'clock. So if you see me leave here really quickly, that's where I'm going. I'm heading over to Grant Johnson to do uh, the funeral for Doris Giltner and our thoughts and prayers are with her family. Um, and also we've been asked to keep in prayer. Rob uh, Dunn is here today and Jeanette was just diagnosed with, uh, she has a malignant tumor, um, but uh, they're very hopeful that, uh, that it it's encapsulated and can be removed completely, um, but, uh, but she'll be meeting, you guys will be meeting with the surgeon on September 11th. And so um, our thoughts and prayers are with Jeanette and, and, and with you and your family as it's, it's, and any, everybody who's been through that knows what that ordeal is. And, and uh, so you need prayers and we want to offer up all the prayers of the church for Jeanette as well, that that will all um, uh, work out. And Merle Polson. Um, dealing with your cancer, and but so good to see you here today. Uh, this is the first time Merle's been probably been in the building in quite a while. So uh, uh, he's been worshiping with us outside in in uh, his car most uh, most Sundays, and and so God's blessings to you, Merle. It's so good to see you here today. Um, others uh, prayer concerns: Susan Loritzen, uh, we continue to pray for her. John Purvis, Tommy Larson, Cindy Strader, Mary Hull, Mike Hultz brother Denny, Tom Anderson's sister Pat, Carolyn Mahan's sister Pat, Judy Schaffner's sister Joyce, and Shar Morger, your daughter Kathy had some good news, some great news. She just had scans and, and, all, and she's cancer free, all the cancer's gone. And so, um, so God's blessings to, to your daughter Kathy. And uh, that, those are, that's some awesome news when you get that news. So, so that's a prayer of, of thanks to the Lord. And then uh, um, we're, we want to lift up prayers. We've got so much going on in our nation. Uh, you know, we've got violence in the cities, and, and we want to pray for, for peace, and we want to pray for um, uh, the end of that violence. And then we have people who are suffering after Hurricane Laura that uh, did a lot of damage in the Lake Charles area and, and north of there especially. And, and so uh, a lot of people suffering this weekend, and we want to remember them in our prayers as well. A couple of announcements. Um, first of all, uh, Joanne Sheldon wanted us to mention that the Princeton Area Chamber of Commerce is uh, going to be hosting a social distancing scavenger hunt, which sounds interesting. <laughs> um, it's going to be the week of September 12 through 19. And uh, a lot of good, great prizes. Everyone is welcome, but you do have to sign up. You have to register. And you can do that by either going to the Chamber website or by calling the Chamber office. So. Uh, um, uh, hope that some people can take part in that. It sounds like fun. And then I wanted to make an announcement. I am going to restart, uh, start up again my, my weekly Bible study uh, after Labor Day. On Wednesday, September 9th, at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to do my Bible study. And we're going to pick up where we left off in the book of Numbers. Uh, and we, we actually, it was a great a stopping point because they were just ready to leave Mount Sinai, the Israelites, and start, you know, wandering. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll start with that. It's, it's, in num it's in Numbers chapter 10 that we'll get started. And um, that'll be, so Wednesday, September 9th. And um, I have to talk to Gail and Dave and see if you guys want to do it on Thursday night. If you do, I'll do it on Thursday night as well. But uh, um, so I'll talk to you about that. And what we're going to do is we're going to meet, uh, initially we'll meet down in the fellowship hall so that we can kind of distance ourselves. If the group is too large to, and, and we feel like we're too close together down there, we'll, we'll move up here in the sanctuary and people can spread out a little bit more. I'll just put a little podium up here. But if we can do it down in the fellowship hall, that's what we're planning to do. And, and people can spread out and be as comfortable as they need to be. We'll have some hand sanitizer down there and things like that. So, so that is one thing that'll be starting up and we'll be making kind of individual decisions throughout the coming months about what other things we're going to do and not do. Um, as, as we go along. So those are all the announcements. Uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. If you would bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, as you promised you would build a house for David and make a house of his descendants, we thank you for the promise that you have made to us that we have a permanent home in heaven and that we have that home because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. We give thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue now 
with our confession of forgiveness. You'll see that confession on the screen before you. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways through the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O oh God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example, point us to the path of obedience, and give us strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'm going to move to the lectern now. We continue our worship with our scripture readings. And the first reading is the uh, kind of the center of the uh, text that I'm going to be dealing with today about uh, David and the, the story of the life of David. David, a man after God's own heart. And I'll be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, 
whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 9. Paul writes, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is, is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is heard according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. All right. Well, we're going to have our children's message here. And for, for the first time on one of these Saturday mornings, I have some kids here who are not stuffed, right? <laughs> Anna, June, and Ruby are really close here, so you guys can, you can stay seated there if you'd like. Um, but uh, good to see you. And uh, Anna, June, and Ruby have both been really good about drawing me, making me drawings and things like that. And, and so I thank you so much for all of the unicorns and the rainbows and all the stuff you two have been drawing and painting and, and, um, uh, for me so that I can hold up on these uh, Saturday services. So it's good to see you in person here today. Well, today I want to talk about two different structures, like two different buildings. The first is one that I already talked about last week, and, and it reminds me of uh, uh, the time when I was uh, having trouble uh, sleeping because I was having these crazy dreams. So I went to see a counselor, and he said, describe your dreams for me. And I said, well, the first night I went to sleep, and I dreamt that I was a teepee. I woke up the next day and, and went to sleep the next night, and, and that night I dreamed that I was a wigwam. And, and the, the counselor told me, he said, I know what your problem is. I said, what's the problem? He said, you're too tense. <laughs> the, the kids didn't get that. You guys didn't get that either, did you? No. 
puns are lost on the young. But anyway, so one of the, one of the structures here is a tent. Remember last week we said that David put together, built a tent, a beautiful tent called the tabernacle, <clears throat> built it the way God told him to, and they put the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. And that was part of our story next, last week. But David was one day, sometime later, probably a few years later, David would happen to be looking out the window of his palace and he said, boy, the Ark of the Covenant is in a tent and I live in this beautiful house made of these uh, cedar wood. Uh, they got cedar from Lebanon. They built this huge palace for David. And he said, I live in this wonderful house and the Ark of God is in a tent. And so he said, I want to build God something different. And uh, and he wanted to build, I didn't have like a big picture of a house or anything or a big house that I could bring in. So I've got this little house that I keep on my shelf. And you'll notice inside there, you see there's a little thumbtack in there? That's because this is a special house. This is a tax shelter. Oh, another groaner, huh? <laughs> Ask your accountant friends about that. But anyway, and so David wanted to build a permanent house. This is a house made of wood. David wanted to build a house made of wood for um, the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> and what God said to him was, he said, I'm not going to allow you to build me the permanent house. He said, your son will build the permanent house. His son would be Solomon. He would build the temple. And God said, but I'm going to do something for you. He said, I am going to build a house for you. And there's a little play on words. God says, I'm going to build you a house but he's also talking about the house of David, which is like David's descendants who will be the kings who will come after him. And so God said, I'm going to build you a house. And then God makes the promise to David and to everyone who will come after David and believe in God. And that includes us, right? How many of you believe in Jesus? Yeah. You believe in Jesus? That's right. How many? Raise your paws and fins back here. Yes. Those of us who believe in Jesus, God said, I am going to build you a house that will last forever. I'm going to build you a permanent house. Now, where could we have a house that is going to last forever? Where, where, is there any house in this world, Anna June, that will last forever? Is the house that your grandma and grandpa are building going to last forever? No. It'll last like 500 years because your grandpa knows what he's doing, right? But it won't last forever. Where is there going to be a house that you can live in that will last forever? Do you know? Think about it. That's right, when we go to heaven, right? When we go to heaven. And God makes that promise to anyone who will believe in his son, Jesus, who is a descendant, a son of David, comes from the house of David. If you believe in him and trust in him, that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again, that you could have eternal life, you are going to live forever in heaven in the house that God will build for you. So that's the promise of the two buildings, the tent and the house. And we give thanks to God for that. And I've got uh, the Bible verse here I'll bring out, and then we'll pray. Here's the Bible verse. The prophet Nathan is the one who brought this word to David. And the prophet Nathan, this is part of what he said to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. The Lord will make you a house. That's 2 Samuel 7, verse 11. And that's a great promise. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for um, your promise to us that if we believe in Jesus, that descendant of David that you promised, if we believe in him, that we have a place in heaven promised for us, that you're building a place just for us, and that's a place that will last forever, and it's going to be awesome in heaven, and we give thanks for that promise because it helps us to live in this world today to know that that is waiting for us in heaven. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now as we make the transition to my sermon, uh, we're going to have a hymn, and that hymn is Crown Him With Many Crowns.
We continue today with the sermon series on David, a man after God's own heart, and this is part 10 in that series, and I've titled it God's Covenant with David, and I'll talk about that word covenant, and and, uh, my subtitle is The Promise of the Messiah. And uh, reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I just want to read that half a verse that I read for the kids. I want to read that again. It's the second half of 2 Samuel 7, verse 11, where Nathan the prophet says to David, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, my good old Uncle Ole and his good buddy Sven were hired by one of their neighbors to help him uh, build his house. And so they showed up for work one day, and, and the guy gave them each a box of nails and a hammer. And he showed them what he wanted them to do. And then the guy said, now I need to go into town to get some more lumber. Are you guys going to be okay if I leave you alone for a while? And they both said, yep, don't worry about us. We'll be fine. And so the guy hopped in his truck and he headed into town to go to the lumber yard. But the guy had only been gone for about 20 minutes when suddenly Sven called out. He said, hey, Ole, come over here. I got a problem. And Ole walked over to where Sven was working and he said, what's up, Sven? And Sven said, well, watch this. And Sven reached into the box and he pulled out a nail. And he said, look at this nail. He said, about half of the nails that I pull out of this box are defective. They're all pointing in the wrong direction. The flat side is pointing toward the house and the pointy side is pointing away from the house. I think this guy got a bad box of nails. And Ole started to chuckle. He said, Sven, 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 you silly little Norwegian, you. He said, those nails are not defective. And Sven said, what do you mean? Ole said, well, if you pull a nail out of the box and it's facing in the wrong direction, then that nail is for the other side of the house. (laughs) I don't think I would trust Ole and Sven to help me build a house. That would be a little bit too risky. But in our story for today, the person who wants to build a house is King David. And David is going to get an offer of help from a very unexpected person. And that person who is going to offer to build a house for David is none other than God himself. But the house that God is talking about is not the kind of house that you or me or any other human being would ever be able to build. The house that God will build for David will be built upon a promise. And in the Old Testament, when God makes a promise, it is often called a covenant, a covenant. And that's why the title of my sermon for today is God's Covenant with David. God's covenant with David is his promise that he will build David a house like no other, a house that will last for all eternity. So let's dive into the story and see what this house is all about. The story begins with David's desire to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant. David's desire to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 and 2, we read, Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar but the ark of God dwells in a tent. So things are going very well in Israel. David has won a number of very important battles. He has pushed out the Philistines and the Amalekites and the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites, all the nations that had been encroaching on the territory of Israel and terrorizing the people in the border towns. They're all gone, and now there is rest in the land, it says. And David was looking out the window of his house, out of his palace, and he saw the tabernacle sitting on the top of the the hill in the center of Jerusalem. The center hill in Jerusalem is called the Ophel Hill, and uh, at the very top it flattens out. Big flat area on the top, and the tabernacle was sitting up there on that flat area, and, and the tabernacle was just a big tent, which was the home of the Ark of the Covenant. I talked about that last week. The Ark of the Covenant was a box that contained three very important artifacts from Israel's history. One of those artifacts was the original tablets with the Ten Commandments carved into them. And then there was a jar of manna from the wilderness days. And then there was Aaron's staff, his walking stick. Aaron was the first high priest of Israel. So David had constructed this big tent according to the dimensions that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And he placed the Ark in that tent. 
And the altar where sacrifices were made stood in the courtyard just outside of that tabernacle. And David thought to himself, here I am living in this beautiful palace made of cedar wood and God's ark is sitting in a tent. The ark needs a structure, it needs a house. And it needs to be the most beautiful, most magnificent house in all of Israel, maybe in all of the world. It needs to be God's house. You know, we know that God isn't tied to any one location, but we also know that the church building has a special significance to us, doesn't it? That's why we want to get back inside. This is God's house. Well, that's what David kind of wanted to construct. But David is going to be very careful here. Remember last week when David brought the ark into Jerusalem, he did not follow God's instructions, his law, when he moved the ark. And there were some pretty drastic consequences to David's disobedience. So David learned a very important lesson about the holiness of God when he was trying to move that ark. Kind of reminds me of a time when I was in high school and I was at a homecoming bonfire at the farm of one of my classmates and several of us were standing near an electric fence. They had some dairy cattle so they had an electric fence and a bunch of us are standing over there and one of my friends says, you know, I've heard that if a bunch of people stand in line and hold hands and the first guy in the line touches the electric fence, the only person who gets the shock is the last person at the end of the line. And uh, so we all decided to, to try that out, but we needed an unsuspecting uh, uh, guinea pig. So we called over another one of our friends, hey, come over here. And we're all kind of standing in a kind of in a line, you know, and the guy came over there and uh, came over to us. And when he got over there, we all quickly grabbed each other's hands. And then the person on the end grabbed that other friend's hands, the unsuspecting friend. And then the other guy closest to the fence grabbed the fence. And guess what? That stupid theory was wrong. We all, we all got a good zap. We all did. <laughs> and I learned a lesson about electricity that day. <laughs> so David had learned his lesson when he tried to move the Ark of the Covenant. Before you try to make any changes to the worship life of Israel, you had better check it out with God first. And David decides the way to do that is to consult one of the prophets of the Lord. So he calls in a prophet by the name of Nathan. And when the prophet Nathan hears about David's plan, he thinks it's fantastic. He says in verse 3, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But then Nathan goes to sleep that night, and the word of the Lord comes to him, probably in a dream. And the Lord says to Nathan in verses 5 to 7, he says, Tomorrow I want you to go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord. Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt until this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel? Did I ever say to them, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God was saying, have you ever heard me say that I wanted the ark to be housed in a building, a house? <laughs> you see, a tent is something that is meant to be moved. You set it up in one place for a while, and then you take it down and you move it. And then you set it up in another place. And the tabernacle, the tent of God, was a symbol that God could not be confined to one place. He could not be contained in a single building. God lives in the midst of his people. He moves wherever they move. So if we do worship outside on Sunday, God's out there too. <laughs> and God says to David in verses 8 and 9, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went. That is what the tent symbolizes at this point in the history of, of Israel. God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. He gave them the law at Mount Sinai. He protected them and provided for all of their needs when they wandered in the wilderness. He brought them into the promised land, and now he has given them peace and security. God has been present with his people all the way along their journey, just as he is present with you and me for every step that we take in the journey of our lives. <clears throat> and that is the meaning of the tent. God is always with us. God moves with us when we move. <clears throat> so I guess David's not going to be able to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant. But that's not the end of the story. 
because the prophecy goes on. And God says David will not build a permanent house for the ark, but then in the second part of the prophecy, God says that David's son will build a house for the ark of the covenant. Here's what God says in verses 12 and 13. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's a pretty cool thing God is going to do here. God is saying to David, after you die, your son is going to become king. And the son that God is talking about has not even been born yet. He's talking about Solomon, who will be the next king after his father David dies. And God said, when that son becomes king, I am going to change the symbol. I am going to give Israel a new symbol, a new sign. I remember when I was in my uh, very first church, and Lisa and I had been married for almost 10 years at the time. We were coming up on our 10th anniversary, and I went to a Sunday night youth event. I was uh, the youth director then, and I was going to a Sunday night youth event, and it was a big summer cookout at the home of one of the kids. And uh, I got there, you know, and some of the guys said to me, Pastor, come over and play basketball with us. They had a basketball hoop in the driveway. But I wasn't really dressed to play basketball. Um, but the father of the family that was hosting us that day, he goes, hey, Pastor, I, he said, I got some shorts and a t-shirt I can give you, you can use. And I said, sure, that sounds good. So I went into the bathroom in their house and I changed into the shorts and t-shirt and I took off my watch and my wedding ring and everything and put them all in my pants pocket. And then I picked up my pile of clothes and I threw them into the front seat of my passenger car, a uh, passenger seat of my car. And I went and played basketball with the kids and we had a great time. Well, later when I went home, uh, I just wore the t-shirt and shorts home. They were sweaty. I didn't want to hand them back to them. So, um, so I just wore them home and I was going to wash them and give them back to the guy. So I never changed back into my clothes. And the next morning when I was picking up my clothes, I was emptying out the pockets and I found my watch and the wedding ring wasn't there. And I looked all over for it. I went over every inch of that car. I went back to the house, I, I called them, I said, can I come out and look? And they said, sure, and I went out and I looked. I searched in the bathroom where I had changed. Uh, I, I, I searched the whole path from the house to where my car was parked, couldn't find it. Think, looked in the grass on the edge, maybe it had rolled across the driveway. I, don't, I have no idea where it ended up. Um, I, my theory is it went down the toilet when I was changing, that I dropped it down there or something like that. Anyway, I, I didn't really have the money, we didn't really have the money to uh, replace it, so I didn't have a ring anymore, a wedding ring. But then on our 10th anniversary, which was about a month after that, that cookout, Lisa gave me a gift for our anniversary. I opened up the box, and there's a brand new gold wedding band. So this is not the original. <laughs> but Lisa wanted to be sure that I had a new ring because that ring meant something to her and to me, to both of us. It symbolized a vow that I had made before God. It symbolized a promise that I had made to her. It symbolized a relationship that would not be ended until death to us part. Well, in Israel, God was planning that when David's son took the throne, he was going to change the symbol. The tent, <clears throat> that tent had symbolized God's presence, his constant presence among his people as they wandered the earth from Egypt to the Promised Land. But the new symbol, the solid, permanent building that Solomon would build, <clears throat> would symbolize God's firm commitment to love his people and to care for his people and to protect his people forever. And in verse 14 of our text, God says this about his relationship with Solomon. He says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And that relationship will be a symbol of God's relationship with all of his people. God is our father, and we are his children. <clears throat> and God knows that Solomon and the people of Israel will sometimes be rebellious. Sometimes they will turn away from God, but he says, I will still love them. And because he always loves them, he will sometimes have to discipline them. In fact, he talks about that in verse 14. He says, when he, Solomon, commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. And sometimes that discipline will be harsh for Israel. The Babylonian exile was harsh. But, says God in verse 15, my steadfast love will not depart from him. The solid house that Solomon would build 
to be the new home of the Ark of the Covenant would be called the temple. And that temple would be a reminder of God's permanent, steadfast love and commitment to his people. So that's pretty cool. God said to David, during the time of your kingship, I don't want you to build me a permanent house. I want that movable tent to remind people that I have loved you, I have walked with you throughout your history. But when your son becomes king, I want to look forward. I want a solid, permanent house, a temple to be built. I want people to know that just as I have been with them in the past, I am going to be with them in the future. But the prophecy of Nathan, that Nathan brings from God to David, still doesn't end there. The first two symbols are awesome, the tabernacle and the temple. But God has saved the best prophecy for last. God has already hinted at this prophecy in verse 13. When he was talking about the kingdom of David's son Solomon, God said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now what kind of kingdom can last forever? Even the most powerful kingdoms and empires in the history of the world have all come to an end. So what is God talking about here? I will establish his kingdom forever. Well, we get another hint in verse 14. Again, God is talking about Solomon, but he says this. He says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Hmm, the son of God. And then in verse 15, we get another hint. God says, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. Now, is it possible that this might be referring to something other than just God's discipline of the people of Israel? Is it possible that God is saying here that one particular descendant of David is going to be beaten, is going to be whipped for the sins of the people? Will one particular descendant of David suffer in the flesh so that all the people can be saved? Well, the prophet Isaiah, writing 300 years after David, said this is exactly what it meant. God revealed to him that what he had said to David 300 years earlier meant something new. And listen to what Isaiah says in chapter 53 of his prophetic book. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah was interpreting the words of 2 Samuel 7 to mean that a physical descendant of David would receive the punishment and bear the sins of all people. That he would be the savior of all people. That he would make it possible for sinful human beings to be cleansed of their sin and their guilt. He would make it possible for human beings, sinful human beings, to stand in the presence of a holy God in the glorious place called heaven. Now the people of the Old Testament would call this promised Savior the Messiah. The Messiah is a Hebrew word that means the anointed one. The king is the anointed one. So they said, this descendant of David, who is going to save his people, who will be a savior, we're going to call him the anointed one, the Messiah, Messiah. And he's going to reign over all creation forever. And in verse 16 of our text, God says to David, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God is talking to David here, but he is also talking through David to his descendant, the Messiah, the one who will reign forever. Now in the Greek language, that Hebrew word Messiah, Messiah, is translated with the Greek word Christ. Why do I tell you that? Well, because the Old Testament, the past, <laughs> was written in Hebrew. But the New Testament was written in Greek. And listen to what the New Testament has to say about the promised Messiah, the Christ. In Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, we read, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. That's where David was born. 
because, why? He was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. But the story doesn't end there. You know it doesn't. In the verses that follow, an angel of the Lord appears to who? To the shepherds. <laughs> Back in 2 Samuel 7, 8, God says to David, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. David was a shepherd, and God made him a king. And listen to what the angel says to the shepherds who are watching over their sheep in the very same fields where David watched over his family's sheep when he was a young boy. The angel says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for not just Israel, but for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, Messiah, the Lord. Isn't that awesome? 1,000 years before Jesus was born, God told David what he was going to do. Through the symbol of the tent, God said, I will be with you, David, right now in the present as I have been with you in the past. Through the symbol of the temple, the permanent structure that Solomon built, God was telling David, I will be with you forever. And then God saved the best for last. God told David about the Messiah, the Savior, who would be descended from the house and lineage of David. Now, I heard a story once about a woman who was dying and she asked her pastor to come to her house so she could talk with him about her funeral and the pastor sat down with her and, and she went through her funeral service that she wanted hymns scriptures everything and then she said pastor there's just one more thing and the pastor said what's that she said this is very important she said I want to be buried with a fork in my hand in the casket I want to be holding a fork and the pastor kind of gave her a strange look and, and she said let me explain she said, in all my years of attending special dinners at the church and potlucks at the church, when the dishes for the main course were being, were being cleared, someone would always say, keep your fork. It was my favorite part of the dinner because I knew what those words meant. Those words meant that something good was coming, something like chocolate cake or apple pie or something like that. So I just want people to see me there in the casket and I want to see them hold me, them to see me holding that fork in my hand and I want them to wonder what's up with the fork and then in the funeral sermon I want you to tell them the story and I want you to say to all of them keep your fork because the best is yet to come and that is the story of God's covenant with David it was a promise that God would live among his people like in a tent he would never leave their side it was a promise that that God would make a solid commitment to his people like the solid walls of a house that he would be with them till death do, him, do us part and then it was a promise to each and every one of us that when we are coming to our to the end of our lives in this world the best is yet to come the best is yet to come because that descendant of David is waiting for us on the other side in a kingdom far greater than any kingdom this world has ever known it is a kingdom where there will be no more grief or crying or pain it is a kingdom that will be established forever it is the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We're going to confess our faith now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to hear another hymn now. Three verses of Beautiful Savior.
Join me in the prayers of the church. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for those symbols that you gave to David and to all the people of Israel, the symbol of the tent that reminded them that you had been with them in all the journeys of their lives. And we thank you that we are reminded also that every step of the way in our lives, you have been with us. And thank you for that permanent structure, that temple that Solomon would build that would remind us of the firm, solid promise that you will be with us in the future that you will always walk with us all the days of our lives on this earth. But thank you most important for the greatest symbol of all, the symbol of the cross. Thank you that Jesus was a descendant of David who took the sins of all people and died on the cross for those sins so that we could have a promise that we will live in his kingdom forever, that beyond our life in this world, the best is yet to come. And we give thanks for that in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we give you thanks for all the people who are celebrating occasions for weddings, anniversaries, and birthdays and baptisms. Thank you for birthdays being celebrated this coming week by Jerry Zebert and Mickey Frazier, by Abby Jaquist and David Olson. Thank you also for babies who have been born. Dean Everett Lauf, born to Jonathan and Heather Lauf, and thank you so much for the blessing of that child to his grandparents, Ty and Lynn Holland, and Neil and Shelley Corbin. And thank you so much for twin grandsons born to Stephen Sharon Saunders' son, Gavin and Perrin, and we pray your blessings upon them that, in, that they are raised children of God. Father, thank you so much for um, the wedding last week of Jessica Chase and Ethan Kloster and uh, bless and strengthen them as they make their vows, their promises to each other. And we pray that uh, you would bless and strengthen them to keep those vows throughout their lives. Father, we pray for those in our midst who are ill or hospitalized or suffering in any way. And we think of the passing of Doris Giltner, who will be laid to rest today. And Father, we pray that uh, um, uh, we, we thank you so much for the blessing she has now of being reunited with her husband, Wilbur, who passed last year. We pray for her family who are grieving the loss of, of a wonderful woman and ask that you would bless and strengthen them, knowing that there is resurrection and eternal life. And Father, we pray for Jeanette Dunn, who uh, was recently diagnosed with a malignant tumor. And we pray, Father, that you will be with her and with Rob and, and uh, uh, get them through this these initial weeks as they plan for what will likely be a surgery, and we pray that that surgery will, will, will do what, it, what it's intended to do, and the cancer will be removed, and that she will be cancer-free. And we, that's, that's the prayer we send up to you today, Lord. We pray that you might be with Merle Polson, and uh, as he is dealing with his cancer, bless and strengthen he and Pat, and thank you so much that he could be with us today here in worship in this house of solid walls, the house of God. And we pray that you might continue to be with Lu Susan Lorichen and John Purvis and Tommy Larson and Cindy Strader and Mary Hull and with Mike Hult's brother, Denny, and Tom Anderson's sister, Pat, and Carolyn Mahan's sister, Pat, and Judy Schaffner's sister, Joyce. And we pray a prayer of thanks for Char Morger's daughter, Kathy, who is now cancer-free. Thank you so much, Lord. We also pray that you might be with those who are suffering uh, from the hurricane, from Hurricane Laura and the damage that was done there and the many people who are digging out and going to have to rebuild, Father. We pray uh, your strength to be with them, uphold them, give them hope. Um, and thank you for all the people who are going there to, to help, with, help them and work with them. And we pray also, Lord, that you might be in our cities where there is so much unrest in Kenosha um, and in other places around the country. We pray that you would calm the tensions that you would bring peace to those cities, that instead of shouting at each other, uh, people will begin to talk to each other and maybe we can resolve some of these things and we just pray, Father, um, for the end to the violence and the, and the uproar. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you can listen to, to uh, Lynn, and as she's playing, I'm going to be changing and heading over to, to Doris's funeral. <laughs>